Dean, thanks for coming on the podcast today. James, thanks for flying all the way to Sydney to meet me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and thanks for having me at your beautiful place in Bondi Beach. Uh, very you're good welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, I just want to get a bit of a sense of your background and your story to start. Um, you've been through a very long personal development journey, which I think a lot of us have. So maybe I was thinking that'd be an interesting place to start. Maybe 10 years ago when you started on that whole journey. What was your life like then? What prompted that journey? Mate, that's a very big question and thanks again for coming and having me on your beautiful podcast. Big question. A lot happens in 10 years. So about 10 years ago, I think I kind of fell into the self-development industry the same as most people do. Come from a place of vulnerability, going through a very challenging time and seeking for answers. So it's very rare that I meet someone in the self-development industry that's doing great and they want to do exceptional. They generally stem from a place of they want to know more or they're troubled or they've got a few problems in their life. So for me, like everyone, you know, I went through a tough time growing up. Um, luckily for me, my mum built a solid foundation and her philosophy was instilled in me all the way through childhood. But when I hit my teens, you know, a few of my friends passed away mm. and the pivotal moment, moment for me was I was working in a business and my boss said to me, you're gonna go do a speech in Melbourne. I said, all right, no worries. And in that speech, I stood up and I froze. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the mo most pivotal moments in my life. And it sent me on this trajectory of seeking answers, you know, cause at that moment, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what anxiety was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what freezing meant. I didn't know what self-development was. And that kind of inspired me, well, forced me and inspired me to find out who I was, mm -hmm. what was going on, what was this emotional trigger that was getting triggered when I was standing in front of people? Mm. And I wanted answers. And okay. yeah, so that was, that was the initial phases for me. And I was introduced to a, a business coach and he was actually in the personal development industry. And he introduced me to Tony Robbins and the self-development world. And he gave me some really key insights and perspectives on what was going on, like within me. And then that just, fed this need to want to know more, be more, have more, do more. And I got sucked into the vortex of self-development. <laughs> I think a lot of us do that. We have go through some experience where it's not, not necessarily trauma, but some challenging experience. Mm. And then we're trying to seek for those answers like you were. And then, yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a good ra rabbit hole that you can go pretty deep on with Oof. all the self-development stuff. It doesn't end. <laughs> it really doesn't end. So I guess, what was like, what was that like for you initially? And was it all positive for the start or was, yeah, I guess what was your sort of mindset when you started going down that rabbit hole? Good question. So initially it was all pretty positive, you know. Ironically, when I first got back from Melbourne doing this, this speech, one of my best friends said, go see the psychologist. I was like, mate, I don't need a psychologist. I'm early 20s, what are you talking about? He goes, just go talk to him. And I walked into his room and he said to me, he goes, tell me your story. I told him the story. And he goes, Dean, you've got clinical anxiety disorder. And I was like, mate, what are you talking about? And that was the end of it. You know, I ha even fortunately, fortunately enough for me, I had the awareness at that time to know that someone else's belief shouldn't define who I am as a person. So that was a big, that was a big step. And then I was introduced to this life coach. And he started um, shedding some light and insights around what could be going on and that I don't have anxiety, I do anxiety. And that was, that was really key for me because there's certain moments that um, it elicited this reaction inside of me. So I don't have it. It's not part of me. I do it in certain events. And we went to try and find out uh, what those events were and what triggered it. So at the start, yeah, everything was pretty positive. I mean, I felt good. I was learning. I was, had all these new tools. I met all these crazy people. You know, the energy is infectious in the self-development industry. So yeah, the, the early stage is definitely a positive experience. Mm. That's amazing. And so, yeah, I love it. Cause when you get practical things like that, where it's, you know, you have this mindset where, you know, I'm an anxious person or whatever the case may be, but then you can actually realize that, no, it's not actually part of me and you can address it and change it. Mm. And that's definitely like a lot of the positives that come out of self-development, just finding those things, changing your mindset around them and fixing those issues that you had 
Um, but yeah, I guess did you then just get addicted to it and just keep going deeper and deeper? Hundred percent. <laughs> you know, I got very addicted. Um, you get sucked, as I said before, into this vortex of having to do more and having to know more and having to learn more. And then there's almost a sense of creating this illusionary problem that you need this illusionary solution for. Yeah. <laughs> so I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. I read really? 50 books, 100 books. I don't even know how many. I got. I had five mentors and it was all incredible. But the one really amazing thing that I got out of it was short-term solutions. So when mm. I felt a certain way, I had a tool belt fully equipped for me to get out of that moment, to scramble the pattern, a lot of NLP stuff. Mm. But that only lasted so long yeah yeah so then i guess what did you start to see that eventually when you kind of went down that journey where you had sort of these tools but you know maybe there was more or something was wrong or 100 percent. i felt that something was lacking because every time i was feeling a certain way perceived negative emotion i felt i shouldn't be feeling that way mm. i should always be up always be happy, always be achieving, always be wanting more and searching for more. And it was at one point a little bit crippling mm. and it was based upon strategy. So if I felt a certain way, boom, what's the strategy can I get out of it? Mm. If I don't have the car that I want, if the business isn't in the position, what are the strategies? And one day I woke up and I realized, hold on a sec, that's only half, that's only half of life. Mm. Strategy is not everything. And then I started diving deep into the spirituality world, even psychotherapy, attachment theory, all these different uh, theories, modalities, philosophies to work out what was missing. Because mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that is so true. You get like all these tactics and things that work in the moment. Yeah. But then normally that's like a band-aid for like a deeper issue 100%. or a deeper problem, which is actually a lot harder to uncover and, and fix. Mm. But that's actually what you need to do. Was I guess when you were when you had these tactics and strategies, did you have that awareness at the time that they were kind of just like band aids or like how long did it take you to discover that? It took me a long time because there's always another strategy, there's always another solution, there's always another book, there's always another mentor. So when something didn't work, the solution is just go find a, the, another one. Exactly, the solution is go find another one. And we live in the world where, unfortunately, the self-development industry is full of marketers. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, everything you see in your newsfeed is marketing. Yeah. You know, my client made 300 grand today. <laughs> Are you? Or, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so very culty. Very, very culty and just kind of a little bit manipulative. Mm. A little bit manipulative. So, I started realizing that I didn't really feel human. Because mm. everything that I was feeling was suppressed. Because every time I felt a perceived negative emotion, I had to push it down, scramble the pattern, change my physiology, go for a run, mm. go to another seminar. All the downtimes, it doesn't really, from my experience anyway, it doesn't let you sit with it and work out what's going on. Yeah, It doesn't go deep. And it's a lot of cookie cutter methods that don't get to the root cause of what's actually going on. Mm. So I guess what happens for you next, like when, when you did realize that and you started to see yeah. that there was some maybe deeper work you needed to do, mm. how did that change your approach to self-development, I guess? Well, it sent me on a, on a different trajectory, a different journey to, I'm a seeker and I was looking for more answers to what's really going on here. You know, I remember clearly one of my, one of my friends died a few, a few years back. Oh. I, w I woke up and I found out that, you know, he passed away. And the first thing I thought, I felt this overwhelming emotion of sadness and just loss. So what did I do? I got my trampoline out and just jumped up and down. Wow. And in that moment, I was like, Something, something's not right here. Yeah. Why can't I feel grief and loss? Yeah. Why do I have to put this mask on of everything's amazing and I'm an achiever yeah. and this is how I must look? So then, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that's terrible. You received this news and then... You know, your first instinct is to try and implement these strategies yeah. of like changing your state. But yeah, it's, it's not healthy to... Because one of the things um, that I've learned is that we really need to do to sit with what's going on and yeah. process it and face it and be willing to do that. Mm. So I guess 
yeah what happened what happened for you next like how did that change your journey so luckily for me my mum, as i said before had instilled this philosophy it was like an eastern philosophy spirituality whatever you want to call it she's a progressive thinker and so am i and so i had this basis to come back to that was pretty solid and i started a journey on looking in you know buddhism or mm. you know there's a lot of indian philosophy or all that sort of stuff and i realized that they are anti-accumulation mm. they're some of the most joyful peaceful balanced people ever and they don't have anything yeah <laughs> so what, what's going on here why am i struggling and working so hard to build these crazy businesses and you know to have these intense amazing relationships and I was chasing everything in the external world. And after doing my due diligence and, and looking deep, I realized that the spiritual journey and this journey of what's going on is internal, not external. Yeah. And that was the key difference for me. Yeah. Is that in order to get out, you have to go in. Oh yeah, I love that. So what did you, what's, um, what's some things and some tools that you uncovered there in that spiritual journey? <laughs> Well, it's the art of detachment. That's the first one. Yes. It's that we are under the illusion that we need something to feel a certain way. Once we get a million dollars, we'll feel whole. Once we have that relationship, we'll feel complete. Once we get the car, we'll feel worthy. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it's not the case. These guys don't have anything and they feel all of those. Yes. So the question was, how can I feel whole? How can I feel complete? How can I be fully loved? For myself how can i do that for myself mm -hmm. and in that moment there's a lot of power there's a lot of power when you don't need anything externally mm -hmm. and in that moment instead of needing you can have a desire so i moved towards the certain things that i want but i didn't need it to make me feel a certain way yeah so powerful are you aware of vipassana meditation? Of yeah have you I done know, it i know that you've done it yeah no i haven't done it yeah <laughs> That's exactly like everything you say. I'm just thinking, yeah, that's exactly with my experience with that. Mm. And I've spoken about it on another uh, it, podcast episode, so I don't need to go into it too deeply. But yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's like you actually realize that everything is internal. Mm, yeah. And you need to, like nothing external can fill that void in that For stuff sure. that's missing internally. You've actually got to do the hard work. You've got to face what's in there. Yeah. You've got to process it and go through it. And then once you do that, you then realize that you just need nothing, <laughs> like nothing externally. <laughs> and it sounds like you had a similar Mate, It's a beautiful insight and you're exactly right. I realized that, you know, in mythical tales, they say the dragon was the one that uh, guarded the gold mm -hmm. and it was always underground. So in order to get the gold, you had to go into the darkness and then slay the dragon. And that wasn't, I wasn't allowing myself to do that in the self-development industry as it was so mm. i was introduced to a different mentor in the psychotherapy field and he started asking me these questions like how do you feel i couldn't even explain he asked me who are you and you're not allowed to talk about business you've got 30 mm. seconds to tell me who you are you're not allowed to talk about business or money man i couldn't even answer <laughs> i couldn't answer the question yeah and he taught me a lot about feeling emotions and when you feel them in a place of non-judgment it actually becomes part of your chronology and you can move forward. And as a consequence, you start feeling more joyful mm. and happier. That's right. It's, in, it's very counterintuitive. It's so hard to explain to people because once you understand it and you implement it and you start to see the results, it yeah. makes complete sense. But you're right. I've had so many conversations with people after doing Vipassana and the most common misconception is when I say, you know, you've got to remain equanimous and experience emotions and face them, but don't judge them as good or bad, you know, mm. just accept them as they are and let them pass. And people can't quite wrap their head around that because in a way it sounds like I'm saying, like, be numb to experiences, don't actually embrace them. That's what they interpret it yeah, as, yeah, but yeah. it's actually, arguably, you're experiencing it more. For sure. But then you're just not having this attachment to needing it to be good or bad. You're not craving for good things. You don't have an aversion to bad things. Yeah. You just see things objectively for what they are. Right, for sure. And even good and bad, it's subjective. Exactly. Success and failure, it's all subjective, right? Mm. The only thing we know is inward and outwards. Mm. And that's it. And so when we allow ourselves to feel these emotions, then all of a sudden the volatility and the ferocity of them decreases. They don't, mm. They're not so charged anymore. Because you don't see it as a good or bad thing. 
Mm. It's part of being human to feel a full spectrum of emotion and allowing yourself to feel them. Mm. That was that was a that was very important for me. A very important insight that you know what? What's wrong with feeling a little bit anxious? Because mm. I used to judge myself. I hated the fact that I didn't deliver on that day many many years ago. Mm. And the moment that I said to myself, you know what? It's okay. Even coming into this meeting, right? I started feeling a little bit nervous and excited. Yeah. And I said to myself, okay. So if I stuff up or if I stumble or whatever it may be, that's okay. Hopefully someone will still get an insight that it takes courage to sit here and lean into the discomfort. Mm, that's right. Yeah, it's and you said it perfectly. It's like anxiety and excitement they're kind of two sides of the same coin, you know? So you, yeah. you can see it, anxiety is a bad thing, but you could also see it as a good thing. It just depends on your perspective and it's not really either. It just is what it is. <laughs> That's it. So. I mean, from a physiological standpoint, it's the same. Yeah. When you feel anxious or, insi- or excited, your heart beats quicker. Mm. You know, you may sweat a little bit. You may be a little bit edgy. So it's the same thing. It's just the meaning that we give to it. One, I feel anxious or I feel excited. Mm. But feel physiologically, it's almost identical. So good. So was that the, the psychotherapy? Was there any other things that you kind of discovered in your more spiritual journey? Anything that helped you or was that the main thing? Yeah, so the spiritual journey for me is about asking questions. Mm. So everything that I thought I knew, I started asking questions. Every tool that I had, I started asking questions. Just, does this work for me? Does it serve me? How do I know that it serves me? And the more you dive deep and ask those key questions, the more you realize you don't know. Mm. And science only reminds us how little we actually know. Yeah. Because <laughs> well, we don't know a damn thing. Yeah. And so the more I could comprehend that and the more I was aware of that, I don't really know anything. That's the truth. I don't know what happens after you die. I don't know what happens with the... Um, astrology and reading stars. I don't know any of that sort of stuff. And I'm not sure anyone else does either. Mm. In that moment, you become more present and you can appreciate the little things like just being here or the environment or the trees or whatever it may be Mm. because you're not trying to logically work out everything that goes on in the world Mm. because we don't understand an atom to its entirety. So how the hell can I understand anything else? Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? And I guess in a way, it's kind of just... Yeah, accepting that and not like, why is that even a bad thing? Mm. That you you maybe don't understand everything. It's just accept it and embrace it and enjoy it for what it is. Right, exactly. And, you know, you asked me what else I learned. It's about challenging every belief, conclusion, limitation, emotion that I feel. Mm. And when you do that, you come to a lot of insights and realize that most of these things aren't even mine. I've picked up beliefs around everything from everywhere else yeah there's a lot of quotes a lot of sayings i see all day on social media and every time i see it from a place of curiosity i'm just like well does that actually make sense yeah (laughs) i saw one the other day it said um in the good book it said love thy enemy i was like we take it for granted but i was like in order to love thy enemy first you have to create an enemy yeah and then you have to try and love them yeah so what if we could just love yeah it's the division that separates the world So I really had a keen curiosity into every single word, every single phrase, every single belief, conclusion, limitation, and emotion that I felt. And it's a very freeing experience. Mm, That's amazing. What, were there any other specific sort of questions that you asked yourself initially or any questions that you keep asking yourself today? All the time. You know, I think one of the most powerful things that you can have is an amazing network. Like even you, we... We've only spoken a few times, but our first conversation was very deep. Mm. And to have those people that you can discuss concepts, um, you know, what is the meaning of life? Mm. All these sort of things. Is there even a meaning? Yeah. Right? I don't know. What is the purpose? What is the purpose that we're here? And if I ask anyone that question in the self-development industry, mate, you know the answer. The purpose is find what you love doing and find out where you're inspired where you spend all your money and your time and that's your purpose, it reveals. But is that really the case? Mm. I don't know. Mm. So I went through this journey of questioning every single thing that I thought I knew and I realized that where does that belief come from that our purpose is to do what we love doing? Yeah. From a biomechanical or biochemistry standpoint, I would assert that when we do a good deed for someone else, 
it boosts serotonin in our brain, right? We know that. Well, isn't that everyone's purpose? Shouldn't it be revolved mm-hmm. around helping other people? Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you start actually asking, when you really start diving deep with the questions yeah. and uh, not just one layer, but just keep going. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. You start to... Yeah, because what is <laughs> what is like reality? What is purpose? What is... Do you have... I'm curious if you... um. Because success is something that a lot of people have interesting definitions for, and yeah. it's kind of one of those things. Do what's, you have what's yours? Def- oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I think I haven't got a I haven't got a well thought out response, but I think the way I feel is that it is to live life on my own terms and leave the people I interact with in the world better than I found it. Okay, that's kind of how I look at it. Do you have a definition for yourself? I don't really have a definition. I just have... I don't really have answers. I've got more questions than anything. Uh So when you ask what is success, I go, well, I don't know. Is It seems to me that success is external. Mm. It's an external thing. We live in a world where you are successful if you leave your mark in the world. You're successful if you get the job, the car, the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the million dollars, whatever it may be. So is success really, if that is the definition, which I don't know if it is, but I would assert it's probably around that sort of area. Mm. Is it success that I want? Mm. Or is it more on the spiritual journey and it's the in, it's freedom, internal freedom, mm. free from the external environment, free from external events, mm. free that irrespective of what, what happens outside me, I can still feel a certain way and I have full control of my internal world. Mm. And that, in a way, is the ultimate success, I guess, because, like, I mean, for me personally, I had experience when I did Vipassana, the 10-day meditation course, where, you know, it's very challenging at the start, but then after, like, the first, like, seven or eight days, you get to this point where it's, like, you have very little in the moment, you don't have any possessions, you just have basic food, you don't have relationships with people, like, you're by yourself, you're isolated, Mm. all these things. And, but even ha- with having so little, just your internal state, or for, at least for me, my internal state was like so calm and so peaceful and very content. Mm. And it was crazy to see that because I think, you know, you can say to some people, you know, live a minimalist life, minimalist life, like don't have too many positions, like keep it simple, happiness is within all this stuff. And people yeah. kind of say like, yeah, I kind of get it. <laughs> but then to actually like, experience it and go through that and see that that is the case in a way was like a powerful thing for me yeah that would have been amazing and it's hard you know it's not right to judge everyone about the how they see the success and the external world and whatnot because it's difficult to get out of the system because wherever you look you're being sold ideas you cannot look anywhere without social media or you walk down the street you know 70 percent of sales everywhere there's always something trying to manipulate or influence you to make a decision Mm. and it takes a hell of a lot of energy awareness and willingness to do the deep work to break free of the shackles of the conditioning and of society Mm. it's a very difficult thing to do do you is like is it possible to do that to live in society and break free from it in a way definitely yeah i think it is for sure yeah but it takes a lot of energy it's like an airplane leaving the runway it uses most of the fuel just getting up um into the air and once it's in the air it just cruises along so you really need to have the willingness to do so and if you don't that's okay as well but for me it took a long time you have to challenge everything Mm. you got to go against the grain Mm. you got to be a progressive thinker you got to think differently question everything that goes on I don't have much stuff because I'm not prepared to be sold on, you know, me needing more than what I have. Yeah, I love that. And yeah, I I definitely think you can, but it does take a lot of effort and energy and you've got to be willing to lean to the discomfort. Mm. So for you yourself, I'm curious, is there, what were like, were there some massive changes or big changes you needed to make to kind of get to that place for yourself where you kind of felt free from those expectations or is it an ongoing process or it's definitely an ongoing process and i don't want to sit here and and pretend like i've got it all figured out because i definitely don't and even coming into this meeting i told you i was a little bit nervous right so i don't have it full fully um, ingrained within me but 
I have it enough that mm. I can still enjoy myself. Yeah. And my go-to state is a state of happy is a state of happiness and just excitement. Yeah. So I think one moment can send you on that trajectory down the road of seeking and asking there must be something more here mm. or maybe all this conditioning that I've had from my family, from society, from the school, what's it giving me? Am I enslaved? You know, there must be more. And from that moment, you can start the deep diving. But I don't think it's one massive event that can yeah. help you break free. Break free. It's the little events consistently over time. Mm. Yeah. Little events build out over time. And then I guess also just... Um, it's like you have to be aware of what you consume as well, I feel like. In terms of like, you know, you can do all these things on yourself and work on yourself. But then like if your environment is conspiring against you in a way and you're trying to go against the grain, yeah, that's that's almost like more of a challenge. Yeah, that yeah. takes a hell of a lot of resilience yeah. and determination because if you start seeing things a way that your family may not and you live with your family, yeah, mate, it's going to create conflict. Yes. So you have to have a lot of willpower, determination and understanding. But the whole thing from my journey, everything stems from awareness. And I know it's a cliche word that gets thrown around, but you cannot change anything that you're not aware of. Yeah. So the moment you start becoming aware of things, then you have a decision to make. Before you didn't have a decision because you're unaware of it. Mm. And that's where transformation, for me anyway, that's where it stems from. Mm. That's incredible. So I guess if there's someone, you know, who is like listening to this and they, because this was the case for me, I was kind of in this place where everyone around me was doing certain things yeah. and going on certain trajectories and then I just felt like that was the wrong trajectory. Yeah. And so, you know, I was like, I want to not go on that trajectory. I don't know exactly what the one I'm going to go on is. Like, mm -hmm. it's not black and white, but I know it's not that. <laughs> So if someone's in a similar situation to that, like where, you know, they're seeing the traditional path and they don't necessarily want to go down that path, you know, are there some good questions that you ask yourself that you think other people should ask themselves or? Yeah, I think the best way to do it is to sit with yourself and ask yourself some key questions. All you need to do is create some thinking time, some space where you can think about what's really going on. Start with one question. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be, um, if you're brought up into religion, does this religion serve me? Or what doesn't work for me? Or what does work for me? And from there, because you've created space for yourself, it stemmed, all other questions start stemming from there. And you'll find yourself down this path of questioning everything that you believe. And I think that is the journey. And mm. sometimes it's a life's work. It's not necessarily one question, one tool, one strategy, yeah. which is what I've learned the hard way. Yeah. I was always looking for that one thing. There's even a book called The One Thing, but I don't believe there's the one thing. Oh, that's so good. And that's actually, that is the answer in a way. It's, it's a constant journey and a process of discovery. Mm -hmm. It's never actually getting to a certain specific destination, Yeah, I think. So. And I think, one, again, I've touched on it before. One of the most powerful things is these questions, having people like yourself to discuss them with and not to give advice on because you asked me before what, what's the advice but I refrain from that because mm. it's someone else's journey just because I've done something doesn't mean it's going to be right for someone else right mm -hmm. so it's having people like yourself and hopefully myself and we sit around and we say okay what is the traditional path and what does that mean what does society and the school system and our parents want us to be mm -hmm. and is that actually what we're supposed to be is that what we're here for is that what I want to be is that what's going to bring the most value to me and then essentially transfer that to the world over time? I don't know the answers, but when you ask those questions, you will come to the answer yourself. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun journey and it never ends. <laughs> <laughs> it never ends. So I definitely want to, I want to hear about a bit of what you're working on today because you you do a lot of interesting things. Yeah. One of the main things you do is you help C-level executives mm -hmm. uh, with some coaching and... That's something I'm really curious about. So I guess to start off, maybe I'd just love to hear, you know, what what is that? How did you get into to helping executives and what does that look like exactly? By default. So when I started my journey 10 years ago, 
I was a sponge and soaked up as much knowledge and books and information that I could possibly that I could possibly get. Mm. And as a consequence of that, I had a few ideas to share with people that mm. they may not have seen. But and at the same time, I was growing my own business. It's an import export business in the architectural product space. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was a strategist. Mm. So people would come to me, whether it be friends, family, whatever it may be, or new people I meet, and they'd ask me questions. But I would go straight into strategy. So that was the first yeah. phase. And then I realized that more and more people came to me, but I really needed to refine my craft because strategy doesn't work yes. all the time. It's generally the psychology first and then you've got to yes. go into strategy. So I continued my journey and moved into the spiritual psychotherapy path, you know, all, all these different philosophies on life and incorporated that into what I was doing in my life and my business. And again, as a consequence, more people would come to me and say, hey, I've got this problem. This is my business. Um, there's an issue with team members or my relationship suffers. And more people were coming to me and it was, it hit a point about, I don't know, two years ago where I thought, hold on a sec, maybe my, maybe I should just start coaching properly. Mm. So I started sending out invoices and what do you know? People paid them (laughs) and yeah. And I was like, well, this is pretty cool. And then one person led to a referral to another referral and that's kind of how it started off. Yeah. So I kind of just fell into it. (laughs) So (laughs) that seems to be the best in a way, it's like when you fall into something, it almost feels like that was conspired to come to you rather than you having to go out and force it. Sure. So, yeah, that's really good that that happened. Yeah. Do was, you feel like that was the case? Like, I felt like it was the case. And what I love more about it is that I've never marketed for the coaching business alone. I've never marketed, not on social media. Yeah. These days, I post a little bit more. But even in a sales call with a client, um, there's no sales script. My theory is that you don't need a sales script. If someone comes to you with a problem and I can show how I can deliver 10x, well, why do you need a sales script? Mm. Because they see the value Mm. and then they buy anyway. And if it's not a right fit, then they won't buy. I think sales is as simple as that. Yeah. It's when the manipulation, the influencing, the language, the structure, that overrides the value that you're supposed to be delivering. Yeah. It's like you don't talk about the time you're broke on your couch with no. 50 bucks in your bank account. No, I don't, I don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to. Yeah. My thing is, you know, I help CEOs and business owners get clarity and bring awareness to what's actually going on because they all come to me with an illusion, with a symptom of what the problem is. Mm. It's never the problem. Yeah. Well, so far in my experience, it's never the problem. They want to come, they want to grow their business. They want to scale their business. They want more leads, team members, uh, they're struggling to employ amazing team members. The culture's bad. It's never the problem. Okay. Ever. So, even in that first session, the sales call, if I can provide key insights or distinctions or different interpretations of what may be going on, then that can provide significant value and in turn, may sign the contract. Mm. There's no, do you want to work with me or whatever? They yeah. ask me. Otherwise, it's not, a, it's not a thing. That's cool. Yeah. Is there any like, you have to mention it obviously, but like, is there a specific example of someone like where they came to you with a problem that they thought was one thing, but then you asked some good questions and you just found out it was something completely different? Yeah, all of them. So, I mean, one of the common trends is someone to come to me and they're like, ah, oh, you know, I really want to take my business to the next level. It's hit a plateau. It's struggling. And I'm like, cool. So, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. So the Rich Dad, Keith Cunningham, which the book is based on, he has this quote and when I heard that quote, it was pivotal for me in my own life and in my coaching career. And he says, if you don't get clarity on the problem that is, you're going to create a solution for the problem that isn't. Mm. So if someone comes to me and they said they're not, they're not getting enough sales in, right? And I took that as gospel, then I would spend the whole coaching session and you know months ahead building a better sales team, better sales processes, you know, how to increase the... Um, their return of investment on their marketing spend, all that sort of stuff. Mm. So I'm building, we build together a solution for the problem that actually isn't. Mm. So I ask questions like what's actually going on here? And I find that they know what to do. They know how to take their business to the next level, but there's something holding them back. Mm. They've got imposter syndrome. They're scared of success. Mm. They 
don't feel safe enough to take the risk mm. to take it to the next level because there's no one they can rely on. Mm. And then we work on those things, not the sales things. Mm. So generally, when a business, when a client comes to me, we spend most of the time, like for months even, work on the psychology. And then they have the confidence and the independence to do it themselves. Wow, that's powerful. It's interesting. Whereas before they would come to me, strategy, strategy, strategy. And I realized, well, they're not implementing. What's going on here? It's a perfect strategy. It's going to work, but they're not doing it. And that's when I realized that most people that come to me, they just want to be heard. They just mm. want a safe space. They want to know that it's going to be okay. Yeah. And I help them realize that what they're chasing, whether it's scaling their business, is not going to give them what they really want. Mm. So how can we give them what they really want, which is just to feel, feel heard, feel good enough, feel worthy and in that moment they become independent and they can go scale yeah. their business wow that's so powerful that's like so you as a coach it's almost like your job is it's not to give strategies or implement tactics it's more <clears throat> to strip away all the bs yeah <laughs> and then they can figure it out themselves well they already know the answer they generally know the answer yeah. you know it helps to brainstorm strategy because that well, what is strategy it's just being creative they have a problem and we get creative together, brainstorm and think of 10 different solutions. That's essentially what strategy is, right? Mm. And how can we test and experiment each strategy to work out what works and what doesn't? Simple. But it's the initial part mm. of making sure they're okay and having someone to talk to mm. and also holding them to a higher standard than they hold themselves to and mm. calling them out for their bullshit. Mm. If they give me some ridiculous story about why they can't scale it, I'll call them out and I'll say, is that really the case? Mm -hmm. And get them to question it. And in those moments, they start collapsing all of these limiting beliefs mm -hmm. and they feel more free. And they feel like they don't need to scale their business, but now they have a desire to. Yeah, It comes from a very different place. Instead of coming from a place of lack, it comes from a place of abundance, right? Because yeah. if you feel you already have anything, everything for in yourself, then chasing success is very different to if you need to chase it to feel a certain way. Oh, man. That's that's like the secret to life, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, secret to everything. It's like, just get your own internal state sorted. Yeah. And, you know, once you have everything, then sure, the your external state will follow. Like you'll have the success, you'll have whatever, but yeah. you're not chasing it. You're just, it's just happening, you know, sure. in a way. So. And everyone's mainly just chasing feelings anyway. Yeah. Why do you want to be successful? Because it makes you feel a certain way. Why do you want the car? It'll make you feel a certain way. So how can you feel those ways within yourself without actually having that? Mm. I think that's the, for me anyway, that's my journey. And that's what I really like to shed some light on, especially with clients. I love that. Yeah. What's like, how would you help someone do that? Because I think for myself, yeah, like for me, it's been like for Vipassana was useful mm -hmm. um, because I got to experience that. And so it's not like it's flipped a switch and everything's perfect now. Mm -hmm. But I've seen like, that yeah, I actually believe that everything comes internally now. So now it's just a process of exploring that mm -hmm. further and developing that. For someone, if you were just talking to them, like, yeah, like how would they, I guess, start to d go on that discovery process themselves? How would you help them do that? Uh, for someone that comes to me as a new client or just someone listening on the, yeah. on the audience as a new client? Yeah, right. listening. We've got two ears and one mouth. So we've got to listen more and talk less. Yeah. So again, I've learned the hard way. Um, I sp I've spoken to four or five people this week and the most of the time I just sit and listen mm. and they get it all out. And then even at the end of it, they say, geez, that just sounds ridiculous. Saying that out loud sounds absolutely insane. <laughs> I was like, fair enough. Mm. And then you just ask good questions, make sure they feel safe and okay. Let them express their emotions, that it's okay. And that failure and success is, you know, it's a perception it's subjective mm. so what's the difference if your business doesn't work mm. what's really going to happen mm -hmm. and so just creating that space of awareness and that safe space i think that that's transformational for most people mm. the tactics and the technical ability and the strategy is 15 20 percent mm. got it yeah what's one thing you mentioned before was fear of success yeah what does that actually mean like when because there's something i've heard a lot and i don't know if it's something i've had yeah but <clears throat> yeah like what does that actually mean <laughs> my assertion is that because i don't have it but i've 
I've had people talk about it to me before, is that we live in Australia, we've got a term for it, tall poppy syndrome. When yeah. someone grows too high, we chop them off from the legs. And especially if you come from a family, like we're, we're herd mammals. We, we live and we connect in packs. And when someone strays a little bit, people try and either pull them back in or they cut them off. And that's scary for a lot of people. Yeah. So if you're in a group of people who are having a mediocre life or they're okay just not really doing much and watching TV and those are your friend circle, they drink all the time, you know, that's okay. But when you realize that it may not be for you and you go on that journey, you may start self-sabotaging yourself or there may be that fear of success of what the people closest to you may think. Mm. And so then you don't chase it. Got it. You stay where you are. Yeah. That's a hard one to overcome. Nice. <laughs> it's the, the truth is, in my experience, that none of it's easy. Yeah. None of it's easy. Yeah, the illusion true. that it's going to be an easy road is, you know, it doesn't have to be traumatic and tough, but in order to get anything in life, you're going to have to do a little bit of uh, uncomfortable work. Yeah. Especially the inner work. Yeah. It's amazing. So, with the coaching business for you now, yeah. Um, yeah, what's your plans for that? Is <laughs> like, are you just keeping on riding the wave, just take it as it comes, you, know, you get referral clients here and there? Or? So I keep riding the wave and saying yes to any opportunity that presents itself, like this one. Yep. No matter how uncomfortable it is, my gut answer now is yes, I'll do it and then work it out. Mm. But uh, I'm really starting to get some traction in the past few months anyway, which has been amazing and posting a few little bits on social media. You don't have much out there. You, I, I think out of all the guests I've interviewed, I found the least information about you on the internet. How beautiful is that? <laughs> it's yeah. Because firstly, I don't have myself in any sort of box. Yeah. So even describing who I am or what I do, it's very difficult because that kind of limits me in some way, shape or form. Yeah. So I only put out little bits and pieces and I've started to realize that um, the more I put out, the more people come to me, you know, even on social media and mm -hmm. going through a tough time. So I realized that, you know what? My job is to put myself out there no matter how uncomfortable it is mm. because on some level, there's someone um, that gets a lot out of it and that could really help. That's cool. Yeah, so to answer your question, I know I went on a tangent there, but continue to ride the wave, continue to refine my skills. Um, I do a lot of self-development, but now it's very specific. Mm. I don't read any book that I look at, which I used to do. I don't listen to any person. It has to really serve my purpose that I'm looking to upskill at, at the present time. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Is there any specific ones you've been looking at recently? Well, I'm doing a, a short course on attachment theory, which I, I just find fascinating anyway. And yeah. basically that, because again, it was a big thing for me in my life that I used to put so much pressure on myself, especially in intimate relationships, you know, that why doesn't it work or what's going on here? And it wasn't until I realized that it's actually not my fault. It's a blueprint that I picked up from when I was a baby mm. from my caregivers, right? But it's my responsibility to change it. Yeah. That was the big key for me anyway. So I'm like, oh, well, this has actually got legs to it, you know? And I felt it's worked for me. So I'm going to look deeper into it. So that's the one, the one topic that I'm looking at at the moment. I love that. Let's stick on that for a second because okay. I, I love relationships. <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. So well, I'm not in a relationship, so I'm not sure how much I can help. <laughs> well, attachment theory is right, really cool. interesting. So yeah. maybe what, what is that for people listening? Like, uh, Mate, I'm no expert, but uh, from what I've realized is that we are a certain way, especially in inter intimate relationships based on how uh, secure or insecure our childhood was, mm -hmm. based on how our caregivers dealt with us, how we got love, how we perceived love. So the way that we are in intimate relationship fundamentally has been downloaded yeah. and installed as a safety mechanism and a protection mechanism from when we're in now, you know, an infancy stage, even pre-verbal before we could even speak. Mm -hmm. We're picking up things um, energetically. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And it's the, the idea is there's three types here. It's like secure, yeah. avoidant and anxious. There's four. There's anxious and avoidant can be one as well. So there's a secure attachment style where... Um, yeah, I won't get into too much, but there's a secure where you feel secure in relationships that you're not too needy or too standoffish. Mm -hmm. Then there's the avoidant, which obviously something's happened when 
generally when they're an infant and it's made them very standoffish. So they're, even though deep down at their core, they want deep connections and intimacy and love, they're very standoffish. They almost mm. sabotage themselves a little bit. And then there's the anxious one who wants to be closer. Intimacy is about being close, 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 and it can come across as needy. Mm. And is the idea, do we want to get from where we are to a more secure style? Like, do we change yeah. our style? So the idea is that there's no good or bad. Mm. It just is the way it is. But if you want a fulfilling relationship, you want to get as close to secure as you could possibly get. Because intimacy, right, is generally about getting close to someone. It's about being independent, but having an intimate relationship. Yes. The anxious normally goes into a codependent relationship, yes. right? Yeah. And they're very needy and they're trying to latch down, latch someone down. They, they feel like they're the underdog. Um, the avoidant, even though they want to get closer, they keep pushing away and keep pushing away. So what is a relationship, right? It's about being in independent, but complementing each other yeah. and being close. So the best way to do that is to be secure. And this can be changed. Your neuroplasticity in your brain, your blueprint can change. But again, it takes a lot of work. It's not like scan your brain and boom, you're going to be a secure attachment style. Mm. But there's things that you can do to move you closer, yeah. closer to the secure. So fascinating. Because I definitely, I feel like I've trended more towards avoidant in the past. Mm -hmm. I feel very much secure now. Yeah. And it's exactly what we said. It's, it's not been... It's almost like an interdependence where, yeah, you are with someone and you've got this relationship, yeah. but you're actually both fine on your own. Like if That's you it. needed to, you'd be all right. But then you come together and then you just take each other to the moon. And that's like uh, the way I see like an ideal relationship. Oh, mate, I, I fully agree. And yeah, so you said that you were avoidant and now you're secure. I feel like that, yeah. So what, you can see, like you can change. You can you can change through. And this is not about judging yourself on being good or bad, being avoidant or anxious, even though those words may trigger or elicit some reaction in you. It's about being aware. And when you are aware, like we discussed before, you now have a decision and a choice to make. So if I'm aware that I'm anxious, well, then I must understand that it stems from a place of insecurity from my childhood, right? And when I go into a relationship, unconsciously, I'm expecting the other person to make me feel secure to that which I'm not secure in myself about. Mm. And that's a lot of expectations to put on someone else. Yeah. So true. It's like coming back to what <laughs> we were talking about the whole time. It's just, it all starts with from within. Yeah. And you got to sort yourself out internally before you add another person in, I think. <laughs> and that's it, mate. The, the journey's within. But yes and no, because some of the biggest catalysts in my life actually one of the like the main one was intimate relationship you know mm. you can only get to a certain point in your self-development journey as a man until you need a woman to slap you around and realize hold on a sec mate you know nothing <laughs> and they bring you back down to rock bottom and you have to kind of oh, go on that journey again so i am extremely thankful for being in those relationships um potentially insecure and just not feeling whole and worthy and whatever that may be because it didn't work out. And that sent me on this journey to try and kind of put those fingers in the bucket that's got holes in and how can I be all of those things for myself and then all of a sudden you'll attract that partner who you actually want. Yeah, and that is a great point because it's we... Some of the... Well, yeah, for me personally and it sounds like for you as well, the biggest growth experiences have always been involved with romantic relationships. Always, <laughs> always. And so it's, you're right. Like even if we're maybe not we don't feel like we've fully got our shit together internally. Sometimes we can grow faster mm. if we, you know, uh, involve some other people in our life. Right. But, yeah. For sure. I was having this discussion with someone the other day about it and it reminds me of the startup world when people have an idea and they try and get all their ducks in a row first before they launch. They can spend years, you know, creating the perfect idea, the perfect systems, raise truckloads of money only to launch it in the market and no one wants it. Yeah. So MVP, minimal viable product. How can you get your idea to the market as quickly as possible to get feedback and navigate through that? Same in relationships. Sometimes we feel like we have to do so much work on ourselves to become the perfect person so that someone will love us. And my suggestion or my hypothesis is that 
maybe you need that other person mm. in your life so you can navigate because they are going to unravel and uh, not unravel they're going to point out and make you aware of places where you're not free we have these mm. emotional triggers but it's very hard to get to that point without someone there yeah. you can read all the books in the world you know it reminds me of the the basketball metaphor um in order to be an amazing basketball player you have to have immense attention and awareness you know your perception is to be heightened you have to know where to throw the ball where your hands must go the trajectory in the air the air pressure everything to sink the ball it's very difficult yet a coach can read a thousand books and have a phd on basketball and can't sink a ball yeah so sometimes it's much more beneficial to be in that mist of chaos to be in the turmoil and to have someone to talk to to help you navigate through all these emotions and stuff because it's a lot easier to turn down the emotions and dissolve all these insecurities in the moment it's very difficult to do it you know it reminds me of uh the the monk that goes 40 years in the himalayans and practices meditation for 40 years and then bring him back for a dinner with his mother-in-law <laughs> and see if the meditation really works right <laughs> You ever heard that before? Yeah, I've never heard that. So it's like it's it's the same sort of principle. It's like how can you get into that chaotic sea, the ocean of uncertainty and insecurity, yeah. and navigate your way through that? I love that. There's actually something similar to that. There's a book called The Diamond Cutter. Yeah, I don't know if you've read it. No. And that's exactly what that was. It was a guy who went and wasn't forty years, but he went and meditated and like lived in a monastery. And then they sent him to New York City to try and build a diamond business <laughs> <laughs> as like a test of like, can you actually stay a quantumist? Can you actually like build a business and use these principles to succeed yeah, yeah. in that? Uh, which is an interesting book for anyone listening. But okay, I'll check it out. And uh, yeah, it reminds me of the, have you ever heard of the drunkard, the drunkard tale? No. There's a guy that, there's a drunk guy and it's the middle of the night and he's underneath a light post. And it's pitch black outside, but there's light underneath the light post. And he's on, his, he's on all fours and he's searching for his house keys. He's lost them. And he's searching around, searching around. Anyway, a policeman walks past and the cop says to him, what are you doing? He goes, I lost my house keys. He goes, all right, I'll help you. So the policeman and the drunk guy are underneath the light post in the light searching for their keys. Five minutes later, the policeman said, where did you lose your keys? Because they're not here. He goes, oh no, I lost them in the darkness, but the light's over here. It's easier to see. <laughs> and that goes, that's observation bias, right? So it's a lot easier to not look where we really need to look. Mm. People don't like looking into the darkness and they're scared of what they may find. Mm. So we look in the light. We look in the places yeah. of not trying to be in a relationship. How can I look in the light where it's easy and comfortable? Yeah. And that is my assertion is that's not where the results come from yeah i believe that i think that's been a recurring theme in this conversation it's just lean into the discomfort yeah. into the darkness mm -hmm. and that's where i have the most growth experiences and get the most out of life i think for sure because i mean everything that generally people want is on the other side of the darkness right mm -hmm. the other side of discomfort that's it cool well sort of coming up close to an hour already it's Ooh, crazy that, geez, that flew by that. but um <laughs> a few rapid fire questions just to tie us out then okay. um i normally ask people if they've got a favorite book it sounds like you've read a lot of books and i guess maybe your relationship with books has changed over the years yep. but have you got a favorite one that had a big impact on you or one you recommend it depends it depends on <laughs> you're waiting for that it depends on what stage of life someone's in yeah so Relationships Attached by Amir Someone. Amazing book. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if you're looking at kind of getting out of the system and understanding investment. Um, the Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, Robin Sharma. Oh, yeah. Mate, that was one of the first books I read. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, that, that's a good starting point. Yeah, it's a good reading list. <laughs> Great reading list. And what's coming up next for you? So, obviously, the coaching yep. business is a big focus. Mm -hmm. Are you going to keep growing that or any other focuses? coaching um definitely continue the ride the wave and refining the skill get myself out there more do more of these sort of interviews and kind of get my message my message across to the people and yeah see what comes of it i love that yeah and is there anything i haven't asked you or just anything you want to make sure you pass on to the audience before we finish up mm, not really i mean the only two cents not advice or anything but 
I know that we're going through tough times now with the corona and, and, and things are things are uncertain and it can create a lot of turmoil and chaos within, you know, especially within families and stuff. And just know, think back to a time in your life, some of the worst things that ever happened to us actually became the best things that ever happened to us. So these times of challenge are an opportunity for us to look within, do some deep diving and shift a few things. Because I guarantee you, like the blessing and the curse is one entangled event. There will be a moment where you look back at this and you go, thank God I got fired from that job because yeah. I went to another job and I met the love of my life. Or I went to a job that's closer to work. Or now I found something that I really love doing. But the masses struggle to see it in the moment. The masters, they shorten the time frame of where they see the blessing and the curse. Mm, I love that. Yeah. And that's so true. I always try to remember that. So. Yeah, so just don't be too hard on yourself. Be kind to yourself and, you know, and this too shall pass. Love it. Yeah. So what's the best way for people to connect with you, Dean, if they want to check out what you're up to or just see what's going on? There's not too much about <laughs> how you out there, but what's the best way? As you said, there's not much out there. Dean Blankfield on Instagram, Facebook, yeah. I'll, uh, my commitment and decision is to put more stuff out there. So hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more of me in the future. Cool. And well, thank you so much, Dean, for coming on the show today. Thanks really for having me, time. mate. Keep doing what you're doing. I love your work. Actually, you're one of the few people that I actually listen to, uh, oh, wow. which is a big thing because... I like your stance and things and uh, you obviously extremely intelligent. So you ask great questions. So keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. I really appreciate it.